This is a nice result because, you know, dominant strategy, the definition requires pairwise comparison of all possible strategy pairs. But this side is just a solution of, uh, you know, solving a max optimization, maximization problem and looking whether there's a common element in the solution. Okay? So uh, it's a nice way to find, it's an uh, efficient way to find dominant strategies. Actually, with these pictures, we can, you know, it could even be more useful. Rather than writing the sets here, what I can do is, you know, mark the best responses. So the best response of player one uh, when player two plays L is T and M. So what I'm going to do, for example, is mark the numbers which correspond to player one, which yields them the highest payoff. So when I mark these two ones, it means that T and M are a best response to L. Do the same thing here and do the same thing here. Here I mark everything because the maximum value is one and one is attained at every strategy program. So you see, rather than writing the best response mathematically, I can mark them on this figure. So what does it mean for a strategy to be in the intersection? What does it mean for a strategy of player one to be in the intersection of the best responses? Exactly, the whole row, okay, there's a row which every number corresponding to player one is marked, okay? So when I look at it, this row is marked. So it means that M is in the intersection. But it's more than that. It says the intersection should only contain M. So the whole row should be marked, and there should be no other row which is all marked. So this row is not all marked. This number is not marked. This row is all marked. This row is not all marked because this number is not marked. Okay. So just by looking at this picture, I can conclude that M is in the intersection of the best responses. Hence, M is a dominant strategy of player one. Done. And I can do the same thing for player two. This time, player two takes the strategy of player one given. So given that player one plays T, what is the maximum payoff that player two can get? It's one. Given that player one plays M, what is the maximum payoff that player two can get? It's two. Given that player one plays B, what is the maximum payoff that he can get? It's one. Okay. So then what can I say about the intersection of B2 of S1, S1 in capital S1? This time, what do we look for? We look if there is a row. I'm sorry, not row, column, which is all marked, okay? So this column is all marked because L is the best response to T and the best response to M and the best response to B. And is there any other column which is all marked? C is not marked at all. R is sometimes marked, but not always. So R is not a best response to every other strategy of player two. So, just by looking at it, I can conclude that the intersection consists of L. And hence, this implies that the dominant strategy of player one in this game is L. That's it. Okay. So this makes life quite easy. In the table, just mark, you know, go over uh, each column, mark the first numbers which are highest in that column. That will give you the information about the best responses of player one. Over each row, over each row, mark the highest payoffs of player two. That will give you information about the best responses of player two. If there is a column, if there is a single column in which every number, every second number in that column is marked, then that means that the strategy corresponding to that column is a dominant strategy of player two. Okay? Life becomes very easy. Okay? Thanks to best responses. Any questions? Any questions? So, my question. 
Can we use best responses to find strictly dominant strategies? So that is what happens if I put a star here. Exactly. So uh, the way to state that should be So for every strategy profile of the opponents, there should be only one best response, and it should always be the same best response. Okay? So it, uh, for player one, there should be only one column which is all marked. I'm sorry. For player one, there should be only one row which is all marked, and there should be no other row which contains a mark. Okay? I will not prove that. It's easy. I'll leave that to you. OK? Any questions? <coughs> Any questions? None? Then let's play a game. Uh, so the second price seal bid auction game that we already described in class. So can you please take one and pass it around? Value, so for example, in mine it says 63, and then it says bid. So you've graduated, you started working for a company, and the company is going to take part in an auction. Your boss sends you to the auction, saying that, well, you've took game theory, you know how to deal with these things. Go and do your best in your in this auction. So what it says is that there's, again, a single object that is being auctioned. Okay. It could be the rights to drill for natural gas. It could be selling an important painting, whatever. But it says that the value of this object that is being auctioned for us is, well, my boss says that it's 63. Okay. So that is, if I win the auction and take the object home, take the object to my boss, it's as if he earns 63 liras. Okay? So what you have to do is you have to bid, write a number here, a non-negative number. Okay? The method that we're going to use is second price sale bid auction. Sale bid, so you shouldn't show it to your friends. They're working for a different company. Okay? You know, uh, so you make a bid. The object will go to the highest bidder. If there is more than one high bidder, uh, I would ask you to write your names and ID numbers there. The object will go to the individual with the smallest ID number. Okay? And the person will have to pay the bid the highest bid made by the rest of the bidders, the rest of the agents. Okay? So if uh, you know, there is four agents, agent one, agent two, agent three, agent four, agent one bids 10, agent two bids 15, agent three bids 12, agent four bids 10, the highest bidder is agent two, agent two will get the object, We'll ask, what is the maximum that the other agents bid? It's 12, so he'll have to pay 12 liras. If agent three also bid 15, there's a tie. We sort according to their index. Two comes before two, so the object goes to agent two. He pays the highest bid made by the rest of the agents, which is 15. Okay. And so what happens at the end? If the value of the object for agent two was 20, Getting the object is like earning 20 liras, but he has to pay 15, so his net gain is 20 minus 15. Your boss would like to maximize his or her net gain. So, sorry? 
No, no, all class. You each have your piece of paper, which were randomly generated numbers. Write a number that you bid in this auction, and we'll see whether your boss will fire you or hire you. So, so his net gain is zero. zero. If he hadn't won the object, what would, he have, what would his net gain be? Zero. So he's indifferent between those two. Exactly. He's indifferent between those two. So uh, interestingly, I usually ask my students to play this game uh, almost every time I teach this course. Interestingly, most of the time, I get a quite a number of students who bid higher than the value uh, because you know, they're not, they, they don't have to pay that. They don't have to pay what they bid. They're going to pay the highest number. In this case, we had only one, two, three. Only three people bid higher than uh, the value of the object. Uh, quite a number bid exactly the value. And a few, well, not a few, not as uh, few as high bidders. Uh, but a, quite a, I'll, I'll give you statistics later. But a, a group, a couple of you, bid slightly less than the value of the object. So as a game theorist, when your boss sent you to this task, what should you do? Well, the first thing is you should model the situation, which we already did. The next thing you should do is what? As a game theorist, the next thing, you're done with the modeling. We have the model the situation. The next thing you should do is, sorry? OK, so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to recommend or decide on what to play. Uh, but so what are you looking for best responses? Fine. Somebody said something's from here. <laughs> dominant strategies, right? Actually, strictly dominant strategies, it was the first solution concept that came to our mind. It's something very natural. It's something which I would expect every rational player to do. So the first thing I would look for is, would be, is there any strictly dominant strategies? If there is none, which most games don't, the next thing I would look for is, is there any dominant strategies? OK. Well, we're lucky in two respects. One, if there is a strictly dominant strategy, the dominant strategy would be the same. Okay. So actually, if I just look for dominant strategies, essentially, I'd be looking for both of them. But still, knowing that the strategy that I found is not strictly dominant is also useful. But the other nice thing is, once we find the best response, as your friend said, but that's a tool. Once I know the best responses, I can make a conclusion about strictly dominant and dominant strategies. So that's an important tool. Okay. So, uh, but this is not the only way. So another uh, another way to find dominant strategies for a game is, what would you do? Well, one possibility is to pick all pos possible pairs and check, which is not much fun. But what you can do is make a guess. You could say, hey, this looks like a dominant strategy. Make a guess. So actually, looking at your answers, most of you said VI. So I would make a guess. I would guess that VI is a strictly dominant or dominant strategy. Make a guess and try to prove it. If I can, I'm done. If I can't, it means that maybe my guess is wrong. Okay, But for this to work, you have to be good at guessing. Okay, For this, there's no room for guessing. Okay, So which one do you want to do? Best responses? Or if this looks like a reasonable guess, take this guess and try to show that it's a dominant strategy. If it is, I don't know. Well, I do know. but. Which one? Best responses. So let's try to find best responses in this game. So uh, once we find that, we're going to take their intersection or just look at them. If it contains a single element and that single element is always the same, we're done. That's a strictly dominant strategy. Okay? If it's not a single element, then we'll look at the intersection. If the intersection contains a single element, we're done. 
let's pick a particle. Let's keep things easy. Let's work with player one. B1 of S, well, forbids let use B. So strategies I will denote with B rather than S. Okay. So the best responses of player one to the bid profile of all agents except agent one is the set of all bids of player one for which for any B1 prime in S1, U1 of B1, B minus one is greater or equal to U1 of B1 uh, one prime, B minus one. Or, or maximizers of U1 given a, a B minus one, okay? So it's a maximization problem. Of course, to solve this maximization problem, I need to know this. But we already wrote it, right? So what was this? So U1, B1, B minus one was, it was a partially defined, piecewise, not partially, piecewise defined function. The situation where he wins the bid, where player one wins the bid, the situation where player one does not win the bid. So if he wins the bid, it's like he takes home V1 near us, but then he has to make a payment. And what is the payment? It's the maximum bid of all the agents other than agent one. When is this the case? If, if B1, I'll write it the short way. If B1 is greater or equal to, well, if B1 is equal to the maximum of B I, I in N, okay? Last time we wrote it differently, but it's the same thing. He makes the maximum bit. Uh, and there was the other condition which said, if there is more than one high bidder, agent one should come in the list before the other high bidders. Well, agent one is always on the top of the list, so I'm not writing that part. That's why I picked agent one to make life easy, okay? And if he doesn't get the bid uh, object, what is his payoff? Zero. So all we have to do is take this as given, okay, and maximize this function. Okay. So actually, if you take this given, B1 is a real number, so this is a function from the set of real numbers, actually non-negative real numbers, to the set of real numbers. So it's actually a very simple, you know, a single variable maximization problem, something that you learned in Cactus 1. So do it. What is this set equal to? Come on. Sorry. It's V1. So your friend claims that V1 maximizes this function no matter what V minus one is. Everybody agree? Well, let's give everybody a couple of minutes to think about it. So this is a simple calculus problem. By the way, I'm impressed that all of you can think without using paper and pencil. I can't do that. Uh, so everybody just looks in the air. Uh, I'm sure you're thinking. Uh, but it is usually useful to have, you know, scratch certain things when you're thinking. Uh, of course, you're probably better than I am. Uh, I can't do it without a paper and pencil. Well, I do it, but usually make mistakes or skip things. Okay. Does everybody have an answer, more or less? Can we take bids? So your friend's claim is B1 uh, of capital, the best response of player one to the strategy profile B minus one is? So the maximum of B 
Let me write it simple, B minus uh, one. So this is a profile, this is a list of numbers. That's the maximum in that list of numbers. So rather than writing it like this, let me write it like that, we'll save some ink. So if that's what? Okay, so any number. So you would like to bid maximum uh, B minus one to any number, right? So it's the interval included, excluded. <coughs> Sorry? Excluded. excluded. So if this is the case, you're claiming that if B minus one is less than B one, then any number in this set is a best response of player one, right? Otherwise? So you mean anything is a best response? So what it does, what does it doesn't matter me? Anything below the maximum bid is a best response, so you're saying that it's this. Uh, open, closed. Okay. Yes, sir? What is it here? But that's an infinity. So let me write. So this is an interval of numbers. So bidding anything larger than the highest bid made up by the other agents is a best response if the highest bid is less than V1. Okay. Okay. Yep. Actually, for example, here, both T and M was a best response to L. So we can have more than best response, but we can't have more than one dominant strategy. Okay. Anybody else have a different idea? Okay. So how do you come up with these things? How do you know that this is the case? You have to prove it, yes, sir. Okay, so your friend claims that it should not go all the way to infinity because if it's larger than the value, you'll get a negative gain. Yes, ma'am? I would disagree because we're paying um, the second highest bidder, so if we're the highest bidder then. Exactly, you see, the key is, as your friend said, if all the bidders are bidding less than V1, uh, and you're bidding more than that, you're getting the object, and what are you paying? You're paying this number. The amount you pay does not change with your bid, as long as you don't bid less than that. Okay? Okay? Yes, sir. Which, uh, I don't know who at first. Okay, so if, if it's the second, if we're talking about the best response of player two, we'll have problems maybe at this point. Okay? So that's why I actually picked player one, to make life simple to begin with. Yes, sir? The second condition, so if the opponents, so this otherwise means that maximum bid made by the other agents is bigger than V1, then I should bid less than them. That is, I should not try to win the auction. Because if I win, I'm going to have to pay more than the value. Okay, that's what your friends say. Okay, any questions? So, how do we solve this problem? Well, again, it's a maximization problem. The only thing is this function is not differentiable at one point. And if you take the derivative at every point where the derivative exists, the derivative is always equal to zero, except the point where the derivative doesn't exist. So usually most of you are used to taking the derivative and equating to zero. It's going to be equal to zero at every point except the point where we have the discontinuity, okay? So 
whenever you get a problem, my first recommendation is to draw a picture. Pictures are very, very powerful tools. Uh, they're very useful. You should make a habit of it. My PhD supervisor, I, I've learned the value of pictures from him, William Thompson. He's writing several books. I hope someday they will, he will publish them. He's been writing them for 20 or so years. Whenever I ask him how, you know, how the book is going, what he takes pride in is not the number of theorems in it, not the number of pages in the book. He says, now I have 700 pictures in my book. So he, he counts the value of his book by the number of pictures that he has. Pictures are very, very powerful tools. Okay? So try to use them. So what I'm going to draw, whoa, I erased the function itself. I'm going to try to draw the function. Okay. So given s minus i, uh, I'm sorry, b minus i, I'm going to draw the numerical representation, the payoff function of agent i as a function of bi. Once I put bi here, I get a strategy profile, which induces an outcome, which induces a payoff. Okay. So somewhere here, I have maximum <coughs> b minus i. Okay. And the function behaves differently on the left of this point and on the right of this point. Okay. So what happens if agent, well, let's, let's again concentrate on agent one. What happens if agent one bids less than the maximum bid made by the other agents? He doesn't win the auction. He doesn't get anything. He doesn't pay anything. His net gain is zero. So for any bid in this region, his payoff is equal to zero. Okay. What if he bids something? Well, what if he bids exactly the maximum? Zero again, he gets the object, which is a gain bi. bi. And how much does he pay? He pays this. So why is it zero? It might not be equal to zero. It would be what? Bi minus maximum of b minus 1. b1 minus maximum of b minus 1, right? So, where is that number? We don't, we don't know. Good. So that's it. Well, not good. Uh, it would have been better if we knew it. But it means that a single picture might not suffice. Okay. So maybe, you know, this number could be positive, negative, equal to zero. Okay. Depending on whether this number is bigger than you want. So it means that maybe I should draw not one picture, but three pictures. The case where the maximum of the bids made by the other agents is less than B1, equal to B1, and greater than B1. So if this is the case, what happens? So at this point, it jumps to jumps here, and it stays constant, right? It doesn't depend on the bid made by the first agent, OK? So if this is the case, that's the, best. That's the payoff function of player one. And this is true as long as the bid made by the other agent is less than B1. Well, let's go step by step. Don't rush. One thing at a time. So if this is the case, what is the best response of player one? So what is the maximizers of this function? Any number greater or equal to the maximum bit by risk. So actually, if this is the case, we have this. Good. We're doing well so far. OK? So far, so good? So let's, no, that's why I'm saying player one. If we bid the same thing, so it's I'm player one, you're player two. 
Well, then what happens? If we're bidding the same thing, what do we do? Well, the auctioneer sorts our names, our numbers, our indexes. My index comes before you, so I get. So one, that's why I'm, so to get away from all those details, that's why I picked player one. Okay, so far so good? Okay, so as this maximum increases, what happens to this function? We need two of these. As this maximum increases, that is, as this number, as the strategy of player, as the maximum bid made by the other players increases, that is, as this point moves in this direction. Yep. Exactly. So this moves in this direction. We get something which looks like this. Okay. So when, well, Let's not be lazy, let's draw a separate picture. Again, these are very simple things, but I'm doing, I'm spending some time on it because I want you to get a habit of this. So the case where B1 is equal to maximum of the bids made by the other agents, then what does the function look like? It's all zero everywhere. Right? See what this point moved down, 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 and then they overlapped here. What is the set of maximizers? Every non-negative number, right? So that's actually Okay, so far so good? Okay, any questions? Now, what if the maximum is bigger than V1? I will not draw a separate picture, I'll just do it here. So that's V1, that's maximum V minus one. So it's all zero here. And then what happens here? It jumps to B1 minus, well, not jump, drops, and then stays there. What is the set of maximizers? Zero to the maximum bid by made all the agents, excluding the maximum, right? That's it. So actually, we did pretty well. We just missed the intermediate step, but we got everything right. Well, everything other than that part right, okay? But also, do you see the power of the pictures? You don't have to take derivatives. Even if you took derivatives, it would be of no good. Always try to use pictures. Pictures are very, very powerful tools, not only in game theory, in anything you study, okay? So far, so good? So we're done with the best response correspondence of player one. What is in the intersection? Is it empty? Does it contain something? So the intersection Equal to what? B1. B1, only B1? Something else? Anything else? Empty. Which one? This one? This? What's wrong with it? This one? Just, just. No, that's not included. It's not included in there, so it can't be, right? Okay. Uh, actually, 
if I, so if, if it was like this, could this be the answer? Yeah. Yes? <coughs> actually, with, without knowing, that's why actually I especially wrote this, this is another habit that you should form. Every time you write an answer, you should put the pen, pencil, marker down, scratch your head gently, don't lose the top here. Do it gently, ask yourself, does it make sense? This does not, no matter what the best response is, okay? So here we have B minus one, but that's a variable, that's a dummy variable that runs over S minus I. So once you take these intersections, you no longer have B minus one in it, okay? So where does this B minus one come from? It's not a parameter. It cannot come from the left-hand side because the scope of B minus one is within this intersection, okay? So just by looking at this, I ask myself, where did this B minus one come from? It can't come from anywhere. So this cannot be true no matter what the best responses are. That can't be true, okay? Again, make a habit of that, okay? Put the pencil down, ask yourself, does it make sense? Well, one way to check is do that accounting. There's, can we account for everything on the right-hand side? I can't account for B minus one. That's a variable, okay? This is a dummy variable here, but it's, dummy variable which runs over all strategy profiles of the other agents. So once you take that intersection, you should no longer have any B minus ones in it. Okay? So I can't account for that, which means that there's an obvious mistake here. This can't be true. But which one is true of these? Well, that's, so that's something that you have to prove. You have to prove that V1 is in all these sets. Let's check, is V1 in this set? Yes, V1 is bigger than the maximum. This is the case if the maximum of B minus one is less than V1. So V1 is in here. Is V1 in this set? Well, that's the set of all real numbers, so it is in this set. Is V1 in this set? Well, this time the maximum is bigger than V1, and this is the set of all numbers less than uh, the maximum. So V1 is also in this set. So it means that V1 is in these sets, not this set, sets of this form, set this set, and sets of this form, which means that V1 is in the intersection. But that's not enough. We have to show that nothing else is in the intersection. So take a number bigger than V1. How do we know that it's not in the intersection? How do we know that it's not an intersection? The second key? The maximum, so take a max, take, so maximum B minus one can be? Bigger than V1. Bigger than V1. Smaller than V plus one. Smaller than? Well, let's say that we took a strategy S1, which is bigger than strategy B1, which is bigger than V1. So maybe take here, what, what do I want? So if I take B1 here, maybe. So take a number which is in between those two, right? If this is the case, okay, if B minus one is such, then the set we're considering is the condition which holds this condition. So the set that we're considering is this set. Is B one in this set? No. So any strategy greater than B one cannot be an intersection because it's not in sets of this type. Then to do the same thing for assume B1 is less than B1, okay? Now find a strategy profile of the opponents for which B1 will not be in the best response. What would you do? This time, take it between these two numbers, okay? Our time is up, that's why I'm rushing here. But what we'll do is, again, as I said, graphs, pictures are very, very powerful tools. So next lecture, 
we'll actually try to see a graphical method to find intersection. Okay? But work on this. Again, we did this a little bit fast. Do it in detail. Did everybody sign the attendance sheet? May I have it?